Thanks for coming. We, um, I was a little verbose, I think, when we submitted the proposal. So uh, this is the official name of the session, but what we're really talking about is who's using this stuff, right? So we're going to present this in three different sections. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the surveys that we've gathered on OER and OCW use around the world. Uh, Mina's going to then talk some, about some user testimonials, and Una will talk about who's adopting this stuff and how do we generate adopter communities, and that's in faculty. So we pulled together four, or, sorry, seven surveys from different OER sites around the world. This is a list of, of people, so there's the Open Courseware Consortium, which is global, educationportal.com and Tufts Universities in the U.S. and MIT, um, FGV Online, which is in Brazil. Sina, which runs the website Baidu.com, and they're in China. And Tufts University, um, Tufts, sorry, is in the U.S. as well. Um, TU Delft is in the Netherlands, and they're, they're also uh, in, in the user profiles. So starting with just basic information about who is using this stuff, who is coming to this, who is responding to the survey sites. Now, I should say that not every survey asked exactly the same question, so it's going to be a little bit different, but it does give us a good idea, for example, who's, who are the educators and who are the students. So at Tufts, you can see that half of the people coming to Tufts, and they had about 1,000 respondents, are identifying themselves as self-learners. At MIT OpenCourseWare, it's almost the same, about 43%. Um, Delft actually found more students were visiting their site. Whereas we found um, that we also had about 42% students, and if we break that down into the different education levels, you can see that on the right, that most of those students are actually in doing their first degree or their bachelor's degree. And then educationportal.com ran a very similar survey to the one that we ran, so we can compare those a little bit more directly. And one of the things that's interesting, I think, about the educationportal.com site is that they are striving to get the word out to a kind of a wide audience about open courseware. And so people who are just Googling free courses often end up on their site. So they're actually getting a slightly different audience, I think, than the ones that are already coming to repositories like MIT or to Delft or even up to us. So this is kind of interesting because it's showing a little bit more about the general public's interest in open courses and, and OER. But they also found that they're getting a fairly strong number of students who are interested in educational materials that are open to support their studies. And again, kind of the breakdown, one third, one third, one third, about are they secondary students, are they, high, are they first degree students, or are they advanced degree students. And then Sina.com is an education, uh, sorry, it's a web portal in China, and they have a, an open education site on their web, so it's more like a Yahoo is, um, and they're reaching a very different audience as well. They did not disaggregate those who are current students and those who already have their bachelor's degree, so this would include, their, their large portion here would include self-learners. And then in, um, at FGV in Brazil, all of the people that visit their sites are continuing education. So what they asked were, who are you and what fields are you coming from? And I think this is an interesting look at um, who's looking to come there to learn more about, um, learn more in, in the open education space. And they found that analysts are their number one audience that are coming to look for things in business. So then we asked about age group. And again, we found some very interesting things. This is from our survey we found that um, we had a very high proportion of people who were over 40 coming to visit our site. Same on educationportal.com, I'll come back to this in just a minute. But then if you looked at China, at Sina, most of their users are actually quite young, are 18 to 28. And even the 29 to 39 makes up about three quarters of the people who are looking for open courses. Uh, and FGV.com, again, similar, that their numbers are uh, younger people than older people. So one of the questions that I think uh, I have from looking at these numbers is, why is it that from our, our website and from educationportal.com, we had huge numbers of people who were under over 40, which has very interesting implications for lifelong learning, versus Cine.com in China or FGV in Brazil that had very low numbers of people who were older. Is it a language issue? Is it a cultural issue? Is it an audience issue? What's going on here? Um, but I do think this is interesting. The numbers that are coming, particularly to educationportal.com, again, which is 
getting at more of the, the general public user, look how many people are coming to that site that are over 40 years old. So um, the potential for OER in the, in the lifelong learning space I think is great and maybe one that we haven't really paid enough attention to. So we, then we asked, uh, various surveys asked, how are you using this? What are you using this for? And of course, most people said they're using it for their own interest. But there were a lot of other interesting things that came up from this. On our survey, the second most popular answer was about work. We're using this for updating my skills for work, and the second one, uh, or the third most popular then, is to support my studies. Uh, Educationport.com asked similar questions. They also asked the question, have you ever heard of it? And you can see here that most people have never heard of OER or OCW. So this is, again, an indication to us that we have a lot of work to do to get the word out about what it is. Um, but if you look, so if you look at the red and the blue there on the end, you see that those are the people that either don't use it or haven't heard of it. But then the next most popular answer is to update my skills for work. Which again, if you combine that with the age data, this is a very interesting, um, potentially very interesting thing for us to examine in life <coughs> learning and job training. Um, this was Delft's question about um, who's using it and why are you using it, and they separated it between Dutch users and international users. And so they found that people and their knowledge inside expertise is kind of like the job retraining. They're trying to look for things to update their skills and their knowledge that they already have. Um, Tufts had similar results with personal learning being the number one thing. So I took these results because they had so many different choices and I aggregated them to be more similar to the other ones. And you can see here that they actually found, uh, which, which bears up with their numbers of students that they had visiting their site, that to support studies was their second most popular. Um, and MIT's breakdown is a little bit different. They did it by the, the type of person that was, uh, that the, how they described themselves. So then we asked questions about where do you live? And what we found is that, of course, where you live uh, and who, which site you're visiting depends a lot on your language. So it makes sense that a lot of the American sites are getting more Americans and the Dutch sites are getting more Dutch. Um, but we found on our site, for example, that there were 57 different countries. People were visiting from 57 different countries that were less than five examples per country. And that was places like Kazakhstan, hmm. Botswana, um, Thailand, all really all over the world. Um, and then educationportal.com found similar results. About half the people are coming from North America, but then a really interesting international mix are coming to look for sites on open courses, which I think again tells us something about how we need to get the word out globally. Um, and this was from TU Delft. And MIT's sites is not based on a survey, but theirs is actually based on their Google Analytics and showing the division of uh, where people are visiting their site from. FGV is similar, 99%, 99.75% of their visitors are actually coming from Brazil, and the rest are coming from a smattering of countries, primarily Portuguese-speaking countries around the world. So again, this tells us something about how, if we really want a global audience, the translations and the localization of materials are going to be really important. So, I know this was really fast because we have only 20 minutes to get through three different presenters, um, but I'm going to put this up on SlideShare. The data is also going to be available on our website um, because there are a lot of really interesting correlations that could be made about, say, age, occupation, uh, and where they're going for information. If anybody is interested in doing that type of correlation studies, we'd be really happy to share the data and to um, help you do it. Um, and also a plea that data is something that we hear it again and again. We need research to support um, why this field is important and how, what kind of impact it has. So please share it. We're happy to put it up on our website so it, it can be available to anybody. There's all kinds of cloud aggregation for data that's happening. We'll make sure it gets on those sites too. So go, uh, feel free to email it to us or, or just send it along. Okay, so Mina has some testimonials. So my, my part, part of the talk is a follow-up on the, uh, the numbers that sh uh, the American <coughs> shared. So the series of surveys were done in order to put basis on the anonymous numbers that we have on web analytics. And 
after the initial response to the survey, we asked them to give us a little more information on how they're using OCW by um, emails or um, over the phone. So these are some of uh, very few of the, the interesting examples. Um, Dave O'Connor is a working professional in the state of New York. He's 65 years old, and he says, I just love the idea of OCW. Everyone has to agree that he's very insistent. Everyone has to agree that it's one of the greatest things on the internet. I was looking into taking some online courses, and my wife told me to check for free courses first. So I found some exceptional courses for free, brushed up on calculus, took some courses on history and Russian. I'm a financial advisor. I use the courses for both vocational training and personal enrichment. Now, he says he really likes OCW because he can skip the part of the housekeeping and go straight into to the real part of courses. So he never takes the first day of courses. And he can review them anytime. He says he can have them on whichever device I want. OCW also has been great in that I was able to take some courses that are better than any other courses I took in college years back. So a working professional. Now this guy is based in UK. He's 20 years old, a self-learner. He says, I'm 20 years old. I have IQ of 140. I was born in Poland. I speak Polish, English, German, French, and Spanish. I'm learning Japanese right now. I started university but quit after the first week. It was too boring, too slow, and I already knew almost everything. He sounds like a 20 year old. He does. I use OCW to get interesting academic knowledge anywhere, anytime. I especially enjoy courses about business, entrepreneurship, psychology, and education. OCW means free knowledge, information in the 21st century, it is the most valuable commodity. I would love to be able to get some sort of certification. So this was his request, that we, we do some kind of um, assessment for the learning. You'd need exam centers in big cities like London with a reasonable fee. I think Apple certification system is a great example. You can learn on, on your own. You can learn from Apple approved books or use special training sessions. So this is a self-learner based in the UK. An educator from US. I'm a 2007 California Teacher of the Year and a recipient of the 2008 Presidential Award for the Excellence in Math and Science Teaching. Yet, I do not hold a degree in science. In order to supplement my multiple pro subject credential with a foundation level credential, I decided to take the CSAT science test 118 and 119. This website, the one put up by UC Irvine, was an invaluable study tool. I worked through every lesson and passed both exams on my first try. Anyone wishing to pass a SAT <coughs> exam would do well to work through this fabulous online program. So these are just some of the, the stories that I've heard over the phone. Now, if you want to know how they're using it outside US, um, this is a page of a microblog, um, microblogging is, this is a Twitter for, for the Chinese, right? And this is from a company called NetEase. They translate videos into Chinese. And they get 1.1 million unique visitors each day. 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 Yes, <laughs> each day. And you can see here that they have Followers, the number is 1.14 million followers. So how are these people, how are these followers using OpenCourseWare is, let me show you a very short video. Not that you'll understand, but you'll meet some very interesting faces here. Now what she does is, she has a study group built around these translated videos. 
and she um, she decides what she does is she decides on a video for discussion. She asks her followers to write a reflection paper. When she she gets the submission, she selects one and gives a small prize, right? And her followers total three thousand. So she heads a study group of three thousand people. Now I'm, I'm going to show you another woman. That woman who's taking the photographs right now, she is a journalist in a rural part of China, in a very small town. So she says that there is not enough opportunity to learn more things in China, in her part of um, China. So what she does is she leads another study group, um, also based around these videos, and <coughs> she, she has discussions around them. She believes that the quality of learning will go down if the group is too big, so she keeps it at 200. So this is how some of um, some people are using open contents, and I know that it's it's only a fraction of a fraction of what we would like to know or the real users, but it is a start. So now I'm going to give this um, to Una to talk about the community building around open. and I'm really honored to present with Mary Lou and Nina, and thank you for slotting me in. Um, so at College Open Textbooks, um, we were founded uh, back in 2007, uh, very briefly, by Martha Cantor, uh, who was our uh, keynote speaker, and a number of other visionary faculty members in the foot of the Anza College. But we're a nationwide effort, um, and we actually have members in Canada as well. And our um, mission is driving awareness and adoption of open textbooks at community colleges. Um, and the idea when Martha started it was to really give a voice to the community colleges because they were not participating in the open ed space at that time. And so that has been our primary focus, but we work generally in higher ed. Um, and we've been trying to figure out who uses our stuff as well. And it's very hard to detect that. The open repositories um, don't actually require anyone to register. So um, we get that information from our members. Um, we have an online community of practice, uh, collegeopentextbooks.ning.com. We're going to hit 1,000 members this, this week, I think. So it's really exciting. There are, there are faculty uh, throughout the United States from community colleges primarily, but um, also um, from four-year colleges <coughs> and universities. We post events there. Um, and our big effort over the last two years has been creating what we call advocate trainers for OER. And um, what we do is we provide training and training materials for folks, and then we set them loose on their campuses because they really understand their own campus and they can create something sustainable. And that's really the push now is away from just creating awareness, but trying to make these OER efforts sustainable. And the feedback we got from faculty, um, and I mentioned we had 60 advocate traders in 12 states. They reached several thousand um, faculty and staff. And the feedback we got from those faculty were, was that they really wanted to work in communities. Um, sometimes kind of stepping off that cliff into OER for a community college instructor, it, it, it's, a big, it's a big drop. And they want to make sure there's other people to work there with them and support them. Um, in their sharing and creation of uh, materials. And so um, this adopter community came out of that. The idea of having discipline-specific adopter communities, multi-institutional, involving staff um, and students. So 
So these were the goals going in, encourage sharing, be able to, particularly ancillary materials, which are kind of the hard thing when you're doing open textbooks. It, those may not be there initially. I'm talking about, you know, the test banks and, um, and all of those pieces that are, that really we need to, to do the full assessment. Um, we want to make reuse as sustainable so as folks retire, move into different areas, there's more hands there to pick up the work and continue to update OER because OER is not a one-time thing. It's, it's got to continue to be uh, maintained. And we want a place to collect best practices and replicate this um, at other colleges. So we, um, we, we, just, we decided to run a grant program and um, a small grant program, we had $18,000. And we said, well, we can probably do, you know, seven or eight $2,000 grants. And so we put out a grant request out there. We, we tried to keep the requirements for the community fairly minimal. Two or more faculty um, at U.S. colleges that would commit to adopting an open textbook in their course over the next year and a half. Um, we encourage multi-institutional support. We think that really enriches the conversation. Um, but it wasn't required. And um, staff participation, I think, is really essential to this. You know, getting librarians, instructional designers, uh, it, and your administration on board. Um, that doesn't always happen um, for a lot of faculty. And so that's what another really positive thing about these communities is if it's not happening at your college, you can reach out to somebody at another college and create that community. And um, student role, we found this to be actually a very interesting piece of this um, in the grants that came in. We ended up receiving 17, 17 requests. Uh, sorry, 17 applications of which we were able to award eight. And the student role was interesting. We expected that there would be feedback because we know that when teachers use OER and they ask for um, student feedback, it really creates this engagement cycle that you don't see with a commercial textbook. But in addition, these faculty are hiring students to do ancillary materials like glossary, indexing, um, all the edit, different editing um, um, processes and also in some of the science areas doing lab work. So these are in our inaugural communities and this is actually the first time I'm publicly stating it. Um, I, we just got the results last week and I just have notified everybody. So it ranges from the STEM area, so chemistry and physics using the Chem Wiki. I don't know if any of you out there know about the Chem Wiki. It's a wonderful OER um, that comes out of UC Davis but it's being used in multiple um, community colleges as well, like actually up to 40 community colleges. Um, and then we have career oriented, which is, I, we have the water management and business communications. So we have um, folks who are working on that in their community. Um, and we have um, also um, more on the social sciences. We've got an American government um, book that's coming out in Florida and we're, we're funding some of their, their um, sort of post-publishing work. And we have educational psychology, which is huge in the pre-teacher service. And, um, in, the, in the basic skills, we've got a Hoopa Valley Indian tribe reader that we've been funding in Northern California, which is very exciting. It's producing a reader that um, features stories from um, both the Hoopa Valley and other indigenous um, peoples. So, very exciting. And um, the numbers are, are really quite amazing. Um, I'm sure that some communities will work better than others, but as you can see there, we have 27 faculty totally involved. Um, up, but up to 3,200 students will be impacted by this, and four universities and 17 colleges. So over the next year and a half, it's going to be an exciting ride. So any questions? How do we do on time? One minute. <laughs> so we really would be to come back up for questions. All right, quick questions. Yeah, uh, just a quick question to Una. Uh, so, you, you mentioned um, that you, you don't necessarily know who are the users, and which, you know, I think is, is a challenge for many of us. Uh, but I wonder um, if you have some, uh, you know, general contact inquiry email address that people send questions regarding, Absolutely. you know, can I use this material for this way or that class? So, you get some hints of what's going on out there. Absolutely, and, and to be honest, you know, we have produced adopter uh, reports for our, for our grant funder, which is the Hewlett Foundation, and as I mentioned, the, our, our online community has 
a thousand members. We actually have a site there where you can fill out a Google form um, and tell us who, I mean, sorry, what you've adopted. And that is fairly successful, but we certainly don't hear about all of them. We also work closely with Flat World Knowledge, who is um, a commercial open textbook publisher, and they actually have some very fascinating um, um, statistics. And in fact, our business communications adopter community is using a open textbook from Flat World Knowledge. So there are different techniques, and I could go on a little bit more about how we work with connections and so forth, but it's, it's tough. Yeah. Okay, we, we're getting the signal that the time is over, so thank you all for coming. Uh, we're happy to talk to you over lunch if you have more questions. <laughs>